Okay, so uh, let's call uh, the next session to order. Um, glad you all are here today. Uh, before we begin the talk, uh, Mike has a few things to tell us. Okay, so uh, as I mentioned in the opening, we have uh, poster presentations that uh, we'll do, and that starts for, on Friday. So I want to call particular attention to folks who are listed up here. You see your name here, you're in the first group that will present on Friday. That means you need to have your poster printed, right? That means the poster has to be prepared in advance, which means your poster is due this time tomorrow, okay? How you submit, basically you have a workspace on Google Drive, you put on that workspace, you put the, the PDF which has the, the poster listed as final, and that's then the poster will be uh, basically taken from there and then sent to the printers. You don't have to do anything, just make sure that your poster is ready. If you don't see your name here, you will have your turn later, okay? But people whose name is listed here, make sure you have your poster due uh, tomorrow on the Google Drive in the, in the final form. If it is not in final form, but it's in some form, that poster will be taken as is and printed, okay? So make sure you uh, get that prepared. Any questions about that? Does everybody know the size that they need? Uh, so the size poster, I hope in the poster tutorials, uh, this is something that's covered. You have A0, the standard poster size. It can be either landscape or portrait, but it has to be in the standard A0 format for posters. Okay, questions about that? Uh, yes. Uh, the presentation. You present and then uh, present already. So what will happen is there will be you the the in the poster session. Uh, the so let me describe what that is, how that poster session works, right? So the poster session is Friday. Starts at uh, three o'clock in this room. Okay. It starts with the presenters listed on that last page. First presenting one after another, an oral presentation, a snapshot. That will, does not have to be ready until Friday. So you will have, those of you who are listed here, on Thursday afternoon, you will be in a session where you present the snapshot. You will prepare your snapshot, right? So that comes after you've prepared and submitted your poster. You present in this session on Friday, the two-minute snapshot, one after another. It's an advertisement for your poster. After that, you will then, if you're a presenter, go out. Your posters will already be posted outside on the poster boards outside. You stand by your poster. The rest of us will walk around and uh, look at the posters and have the poster sessions. There will be refreshments served, too, during this time. Now, just to remind you, I said there are prizes. Uh, the competition, the grand prize is 100 euros, cash, and we'll have other prizes at different levels. Okay, so this is a, you know, this is a, in addition to you wanting to present your science and, you know, the opportunity to practice uh, communication, there's an opportunity to win some cash, too. Okay, so that is all I have to say about that. Any questions? But again, if you see your name um, here, then you need to have your poster submitted uh, by this time tomorrow on the Google Drive in your workspace. And the rest of you, if you don't see your name, you will have an opportunity to turn your posters in later. Yes? What is the criteria for evaluation of posters by the Okay, so when you attend the poster session, you will have this discussed by the poster tutors. Am I on the same page as the poster tutors? There's a rubric that is, tells you the criteria and the scoring. Uh, poster presenter, or poster tutors, Lorette, yes? yes? Yeah. You're going to, and Luigi and myself, we go over that in the uh, poster uh, tutorial session. And I'll say a little bit more about the details of the judging, exactly how it's judged before the first session. But that's, um, that's, uh, that's that. Okay? Okay. Any other announcements that we need before we begin the talk? 
Okay, well then it's my pleasure to introduce Luigi Cristofolini. Cristofolini, yeah. Thank you. It's a long uh, name. I, uh, <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> From Parma. Parma, and, yeah. And uh, take it away. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so uh, it works. So it's my first time here, so I hope I get the spirit of this gathering and give you some hint of uh, what uh, can be interesting in surface physics and also take the opportunity to give more details about the experiment that, uh, that you can do in the hands-on session. And finally, I will <coughs> also talk about something that is not really a tabletop experiment. So why should one focus on soft inter interfaces? Why soft interfaces are important, at least interesting to me? Uh, because of beer. Oops. <laughs> no. The pointer is, this is not the pointer. How can I get the pointer? Uh, should be laser pointer as well. Here, sorry, okay. So. Uh, if you look at, at the beer froth, for instance, it's a complex system uh, with a hierarchy of structures on different scales. Uh, starting from the largest scale, you have a, a foam which consists of gas bubbles which are separated by the so called plateau, uh, which are made of bilayers of uh, uh, surfactants and water in between. And if you look on the, this is on the centimeter scale or millimeter scale. And uh, if you go on the, on the smaller scale, if you go to the plateau, if you look into the details of this plateau, you discover that uh, they are formed by surfactant molecules which have a size of nanometers. And uh, what is happening at this scale actually is determining what is happening on the other scales. So the stability of a foam, as an mentioned, of many systems is determined by the dynamics, the structure and dynamics that you have in the local scale on the surface, and the surface made of soft material. Uh, just another example, while I was preparing this talk, uh, this uh, nature cover was uh, up showing that uh, basically the, the surfactants, the organic surfactants, have a role in determining uh, formation of a nucleation of water droplets in clouds, and is it too loud? Uh, so I have also an effect in climate. So from one extreme to the other, I mean, you have soft interfaces that are determining the behavior of your system from your beer to um, climate change. <clears throat> so the outlook of, uh, the, of this kind of lesson or talk, I will start from simple surfaces, uh, focusing on lamwe monolayers that are very simple, uh, lam and uh, then just a brief overview of self-assembled and layer-by-layer structures. And uh, then focusing on more complex systems like foams and emulsion, and then this will give me the opportunity to talk about the diffusing wave spectroscopy experiment that some of you will do in the hands-on session in the, uh, in, in the next days. And then, as I was saying, uh, I think that it could be of interest, for at least for some of you, to know about X-ray techniques which are not tabletop, it's large-scale facilities, but uh, if you have a good sample, a good idea, you can submit your proposal and get beam time and so do maybe good experiments and do good science at uh, little cost for you. And uh, yeah, it's, that's why I think it's not really tabletop, but it can make sense in this uh, audience. And uh, yeah, so just a bit of history. The studies of soft surfaces perhaps started with Benjamin Franklin with a drop of oil on a pond and discovered that this drop of oil makes the surface smoother, but it didn't go, he didn't go much farther. It was Lord Rayleigh who quantified the thickness of this layer, and it is astonishing, but if you think at that time, it was the time at which uh, <coughs> the size of the molecule was not clear. It was, I mean, Avogadro number was not so well established, and by measuring the thick, I mean, measuring the, the size of the, of the, um, of the drop uh, oil spread, uh, it called the, yeah, the, you, can, you can extract an estimate, a rough estimate of the thickness of the layer, and this is a, the thickness of your molecule, which comes out to be, at that time, 1.6 nanometers, I mean, it was not nanometer at that time, it was measured in inches, but <laughs> converted to <laughs> modern units, and it is close to 
to our estimate of a molecular size. And then uh, after that, uh, people started to, to work on this in a more uh, systematic way. And Pockets was working in her kitchen doing layers. And uh, it was with the Lamui and uh, Blodgett that this thing became uh, in, to be studied, started to be studied in a more uh, modern way in, uh, in laboratory. <coughs> and uh, yeah, uh, so these more or less people that mostly contributed to the development of uh, Lamware uh, monolayer studies. So, <coughs> so first of all, uh, when you have an interface between two uh, phases, you have a surface tension. Why do you have a surface tension? A surface tension, I mean, in the simple case of uh, air water, you can understand it. It's due to the fact that molecules in the water are happily bound to other molecules all around. Molecules on the surface are not so happily bound because they don't have the upper half of the world to bind with. To, to bind with. <coughs> so there's a kind of additional cost in energy to have this surface. You can also uh, model this in uh, this way. You have molecules here, and I mean less molecules here. So it, this is the the interface, and there's some energy associated with this interface. And we return on this later on. You can also think of this uh, surface energy as a force. <coughs> as a line tension, so a force per unit of length, they mention it, they are the same. And <clears throat> you can use this virtual uh, work argument to show that if you move this black line to extend the, the, dark, the, the darker area, to, to, to enlarge the darker area by the amount of days, like time cell, you are creating an extra surface and you're making an, a, <clears throat> a work. And this work is related to this force. So the surface tension is equivalent to a force per unit of length. So you measure it in newtons per meter or millinewtons per meter, probably. And depending, depending on the nature of your liquid, you may have different values of this surface tension. For water, it's particularly high because of the strength of the hydrogen bonds between water molecules. And it is uh, lower, I mean, if you put ethanol or uh, other hydrogen forming, hydrogen bond forming system, you have a lower surface tension. Uh, just for curiosity, you have a very high, even one of the magnitude larger surface tension on the surface of mercury because you have the sea of electrons that are keeping the mercury together that is forming even a stronger bond. But okay, uh, in the past, people were working also on the water, on the, on the mercury surface, but it is kind of unhealthy. So it's not so common nowadays. I mean, you can do it, but it's a, just a niche. Not many, uh, so not, not many things happen. Now. So what are the effects of this surface pressure? The first effect that comes to my mind is uh, Laplace pressure. Inside of a bubble, you have a pressure that is larger than the pressure that you have outside the, bu the same bubble. And the reason is that you have all this surface that is kind of pulling together and Ready. This guy would go to zero, would, would like to shrink. But at the same time, you have some gas inside that is equilibrating. And the difference in pressure, you, work, you can calculate out. It's two times gamma, which is this surface tension we are mentioning, over the radius of the bubble. Uh, remember this the radial dependence, one of the radius, because it is important. We were talking about foams. We'll talk again about foams later on. And this Laplace pressure, this is called Laplace pressure, this Laplace pressure and the difference of Laplace pressure that you have between large and smaller bubbles makes a, an effect in terms of migration of gas from small droplets, from small bubbles to large rubble, bubbles. And this phenomenon is called Oswald ripening. I mean, so this is important for the evolution of a foam. If you go to a soap bubble, it's a double. A soap bubble is a double layer. You have an outer layer and an inner layer. So you have twice this uh, Laplace pressure, and so it's doubled in, in a gas uh, bubble. So it's single interface, double interface. Another uh, phenomenon in which you see surface tension is wine tears. If you like uh, red wine or cognac, uh, maybe you have already observed that if you let it rest in a glass, it will form this weird uh, uh, tear. Why does it happen? It happens because the mixture of ethanol and water 
plus more interesting things that make the wine. Uh, this mixture has some surface tension. It will climb on the hydrophilic surface of glass. Hydrophilic means it likes, I will come to it later on, but likes the water. It will climb on, the, on here. And then uh, as the liquid is climbing, ethanol is evaporating. And as the mixture gets poorer in ethanol, surface tension grows. And if the surface tension is high, you form droplets to reduce the surface. <coughs> and once these droplets are formed, they, they, they get down. So this is the mechanism for formation in uh, wine tears. So next time you're drinking with your friends, you can bore or impress them, depending on their attitude <laughs> with this story about wine tears. <laughs> Another effect of surface tension, uh, everybody knows, is capillarity. I mean, you probably study this in primary school when you know, trees feed water uh, in this way. And uh, OK, I won't spend much on this. I mean, I think that you already know this. Uh, maybe you don't know the <coughs> some defects of capillarity. One effect that I happen to study is the uh, role that capillarity has on chocolate blooming. You know what is chocolate blooming? When you have chocolate, all chocolate, it has uh, it starts to develop a uh, whitish ap appearance on the surface. And the seller says it's a proof it is genuine. Actually, it's not a proof it is genuine. It's proof that it is old and badly stored. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah. Um, so why is chocolate blooming? Uh, bloom is originated by migration of fat through pores. If you look uh, again, as I was saying for the foam, it's true for many, many systems. You have a hierarchy of structures in chocolate. You start from the molecular, if you start from the molecular level, you have triglycerides that form, that aggregate into crystals, or crystals, or I mean, it's maybe not very proper to call them crystals, it's polycrystalline, or amorphous, solid matrices, and uh, pores in between, and in, in those pores, a uh, liquid fraction of fat can migrate, and then you have pores between particles, and on a larger scale, you have particles that are made of sugar, of cocoa butter, and other things. And if you look at the time evolution of the whitish appearance, this red line, is the L value, I mean, it's a, oh, just a matter of parameter, a way of parameterizing the colors. L, the L is uh, the, the whitish appearance of, of the color. And you see, this object stays constant, flat, and at some point it starts rising. Uh, if you look at the surface roughness, like with a microscope, maybe atomic force microscope is better because you want to go in, in details, but you see the surface roughness starts to develop early, and this is due to the migration, and migration and recrystallization of the surface. And when the crystals are, are very small, they don't scatter light effectively, very, very little scattering, so the surface is still shiny. But as they grow, the surface starts to become rough and scatters light, and uh, the blooming appears. So in conclusion, Surface microscopy is an early predictor for the blooming. I mean, this is something that is related to the fact that you can anticipate what is happening and perhaps vary conditions that it's, so that it's not happening so much. I mean, just an example of where you wouldn't expect uh, surface forces to act, and actually they are acting and uh, d dominating the phenomenon. I was mentioning contact angle. <coughs> I was mentioning, actually, hydrophilicity which is measured by the contact angle, that is the angle that a droplet of water, say, would form on the surface. Uh, if you have a solid surface, this is the case here. If you have a liquid surface that could deform and form a lens, so you have three parameters, but in any case, uh, Young's law would, I mean, just a way of stating equilibrium forces, the tension due to each interface interface 1, 2, 1, 3, and 2, 3. The vectorial sum of these tensions has to be 0 at equilibrium. And you may also define a spreading coefficient by this difference. <coughs> and if this spreading coefficient is uh, larger than 0, sorry, I translated my Italian lesson, but I didn't translate all of them. You have total wetting, so the liquid would spread completely. Uh, if it is below zero, you have partial wetting, so the contact angle is between something in between zero and 90 degrees. 
there's a lot of interest in developing super hydrophobic surfaces and amph amphiphobic as well in surfaces <coughs> because of if you imagine if you can make a surface that is really repelling water completely uh, that is kind of self cleaning so ca can be self cleaning you can um, imagine that this surface would be <coughs> Uh, kept uh, uh, clean from, from dust and from pollution. Uh, this could be useful for membranes, for water purification, for air filters and the automotive section. Uh, the, problem, the state of the art in this field is that we are able of doing very nice super hydrophobic and super amphiphobic, that is hydrophobic and also repellent for, for grease, but uh, uh, in the laboratory. And these very nice surfaces are very delicate. They won't stand in real life applications. So uh, all these all this is made by making a rough surface with nanostructures on many scales, and these very nice nanostructures won't stay there forever, but will be probably taken away just wiping the surface. So it's, this is the state of the art. Coming to interfaces, uh, to, to, to interfacial layers, we have to introduce uh, surface pressure. Surface pressure is the reduction of the surface tension we are talking about by the action of something that I put at the interface. Imagine that I put molecules that like to stay on the surface. That would reduce the cost of the surface. And typically, this molecule could be amphiphilic molecules, molecules that have the double nature of liking water on one side, being polar and liking water on one side, and being apolar on the other side, liking the fat or the grease part. Yeah. So this molecule would reduce the cost of the surface. <coughs> Examples are surfactants, like lung surfactant, we'll talk about later on, uh, briefly after, uh, soap and emulsifiers. Uh, let's start with lung surfactant. Uh, you know when you breathe, the lungs expand, uh, so you have an increase of surface, which is what you need for the oxygen to be absorbed by, the, by your, uh, by your uh, body, by the, by the blood. But this, cost, but this surface increase has an energy cost, as we saw. And uh, in order, for, in order to, for this to happen with the low cost, you have surfactants. Otherwise, you have, if you had no surfactants, basically the, the lungs would collapse because the, the minimum energy is when you have all the air out and all the liquid in. And to prevent this collapse, uh, you have these lung surfactants, which are a mixture of phospholipids uh, and other components, among which some proteins. And uh, yeah, this, there are some problems related to, to this uh, when you have newborn, ba premature babies, which are born too early. They don't have this natural surfactant, so they wouldn't survive. They wouldn't stand in, air, couldn't breathe in air, and. Uh, you have to provide them with some drugs, inhalation drugs, uh, that uh, substitute the natural surfactant so that the premature baby can start breathing. So there's some research going on on this. Sorry, yeah. Uh, to, to model this system that is uh, far too complex for uh, many experimental techniques, uh, to model the system, we can. Uh, uh, build a, a very simplified model that is really tabletop. <laughs> it's a, if you make a single layer at the air water interface, what is called a Langmuir monolayer, Langmuir film, and uh, uh, with a Lang, uh, Langmuir trough, we mean something in which you can study the film that you have at the interface as a function of the area that you are allowing the molecules so remember the, the act of breathing, expanding, and reducing. We can play this game by moving the barriers. And at the same time, maybe we measure the surface tension by measuring, you remember the surface energy is also a force per unit of length. So we can put a balance here. And if the balance is pulled by the, by the layer, if I measure the force that I have here, I have a measure, a direct measurement of the surface tension. So as a function of the area that I am allowing the molecules to have, I can measure the tension, so the energy of the surface. So if I take a system that is made with a phospholipid, which is uh, maybe this, uh, this is a schematic view of, the uh, of a phospholipid, in which I have uh, this double chain that is hydrophobic, and uh, a 
polar head, which will go in, in water. If I make a monolayer of this <coughs> phospholipid in, uh, on, on, a lamy, on a lamy trough, I can measure as a function of the area I'm allowing the molecule to have, I can measure the energy that they have. I can also use other techniques like uh, fluorescence microscopy or uh, other techniques that are more complex, I won't talk about, uh, Brewster angle microscopy or ellipsometry to measure thickness and lateral structure of this film. And this is the case for phospholipids, for the simplest phospholipid I was mentioning, this DPPC, has a variety of phases from, uh, on this side you have a lot of space for the molecules, so you have an expanded, liquid expanded phase. As you compress this, it starts to con convert into a compressed phase. And you have a first order transition with a plateau of coexistence of the two phases. This is analogous to what you have in 3D, simply it's made in 2D, but the phenomenon is the same as you when you have a phase transition in, three phase, in 3D. And, but the, the good thing in, in this case is that I have all this thing in, in my laboratory on, 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 a, on a small trough, and I can apply other techniques to characterize, to see what is happening, not only the energy, but the lateral size, the thickness, uh, other things. Uh, just an example. Yeah, yeah, uh, another example of things that you can study with this Langmuir technique uh, is uh, polymers. Polymers <coughs> can, some polymers can spread on the water surface. Not all of them. Very hydrophilic polymers would simply sink, would be dissoluted if I take polyethylene oxide that would go in the surface. But some polymers would stay on the surface and uh, could have different conformation, and here I can apply the concepts of, uh, yeah, of uh, the same concept that I have in 3D, maybe you, you know, uh, in 3D, I mean in a solution, a polymer can have different configuration depending if it is in good solvent, it will spread out completely, if it is in a bad solvent, it will collapse completely, and if it is in, in the intermediate situation in which the solvent is as good as the polymer, it's the so-called theta, theta condition. It will be a uh, random walk. And uh, uh, this same thing happens on the surface. Uh, depending on the behavior of the polymer on the surface, you can have uh, a good solvent situation in which the solvent, in which the polymer really spreads out and likes to, to spread out. Or in the poor solvent regime, you have patches that are kind of rigid and uh, avoiding each other. And, uh, in either case, you have a different dependence of the surface pressure from the area. So just by measuring the, the, isot the, um, the Lamuir isotherm, that is the surface pressure as a function of the area, seeing how this changes, you can tell uh, which kind of situation you have. Uh, these are two different polymers, polyterbutacrylate, polyterbutyl metacrylate. One is a good solvent. This one is a good solvent, so it's a very shallow dependence. Uh, PTBMA is in a poor solvent condition, so it has much, it's not seeing each other at low concentration, and all of a sudden you have a strong interaction between, because it's, it's in, in this regime here. Uh, there are also cases in which you can revert the same polymer from one situation to the other. Uh, yesterday, <coughs> in, the, in, the, in the poster session, there was uh, yeah, the, the azobenzene, uh, I don't see, okay, uh, anyhow. Uh, uh, I have this, poly uh, this polymer that has uh, azobenzene side chain, and the good thing in this azobenzene, uh, the interesting thing for me, is that uh, azobenzene can be converted from one form to the other, isomer, they say the chemist, from one isomer to the other by light. And uh, the equilibrium isomer has very little dipolar moment, so it's not polar, doesn't want to go in water. The cis isomer that I obtained by illuminating with UV light has a, a lot of dipolar moment. So it, it's about 3.5 device, so it's hydrophilic. And by converting one to the other, I can vary the nature of the, of the polymer. And you see here, the equilibrium trans configuration is the red line, very steep. The cis with a strong dipolar moment, hydrophilic, is the <clears throat> much shallower. It starts seeing each other at large distance, but then, and uh, if I put it in, in, in the scaling uh, low uh, plot, in a log-log plot, I can really extract those parameters. They are the same data recast 
as a function of uh, pressure as a function of concentration that is the reciprocal of the area. And you can really tell uh, one is in bad solvent or theta, but theta to bad solvent and one is in the good solvent condition. Right? This is just. Uh, those Langmuir films can be also used to, to make structures. So once you have created the Langmuir monolayer, you can transfer it onto a solid substrate. Uh, you can do it with a vertical substrate that is sinked into, sunk in, in the liquid and then extracted. And this is the so-called Langmuir blodgett deposition in which you dip and get out and each stroke you get an additional layer uh, you can also, I mean, this is good in some cases. In other cases, you prefer to use the Langmuir Schaeffer deposition, in which you have a flat surface. And this is faster and uh, better for rigid films. This is more accurate for soft films. And in this way, you can create multi layers or multi structures, and, and, can, and this can be of use. <coughs> other techniques to make layers uh, layer by layer, layer by layer deposition. I mean, I have time, yeah. Uh, now I'm mentioning another technique to make layers that has not to do with the surface of the air water, but directly with the adhesion of the on the substrate. If you have a substrate that has, bears some charge, you can have polymers, po polyanions, and polycations that adhere on the surface. So in this example, I'm starting from a surface that bears negative charges, that would be the case of silicon oxide covered by this. Natural si silicon covered by this natural oxide, which has the OH minus uh, groups, and this would attract cations. So, if I have a polycation uh, that would adhere on the surface and leave probably an excess of positive charge because of the polymeric nature, so if I wash this out and sink it into polyanion, then wash again and I can make a, a structure, a, a multi layer structure. And uh, yeah, here are a few examples of polymers that are uh, you commonly used for doing this. And uh, uh, this can be done on, on flat objects. That is, could be interesting. But perhaps more interesting, you can make capsules with this. It, this was a <coughs> quite popular uh, 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, this was in the group of Mowell from uh, Max Planck in, uh, in Gulm. Uh, you start with some colloidal particles. <laughs> Uh, which can be covered by successive layers of polymers, and then the colloidal particle can be dissolved. Maybe if it is cal calcium carbonate, you dissolve it in an acidic environment, and you can replace the content. And so you can get these nice structures that, I mean, nice, few micron structures that are capsules that can be controlled, whose porosity can be controlled by the pH, by the acidity of the, of the environment. Other techniques, just to, to mention, just to give you the flavor of things that you can do with surface, soft interfaces, uh, self-assembly. Self-assembly occurs in many cases. The most famous uh, example, perhaps, is that of thiol on gold. Thiol is, is, is uh, sulfur that binds some gold. And, and you can form monolayers in this way. Uh, not only you have self-assembly also in nature, so phospholipids form bilayers and vesicles. And it's not only confined to to interfaces because this the self assembly also for uh, viruses do self assemble and uh, um, many structures that do self assembly basically uh, also protein folding is can be considered self assembly but it's not interfaces okay uh, coming back to general problem i talked about insoluble surfactants surfa molecules that will stay only on the water uh, most commonly you have molecules that have a balance between staying in the water and on the surface. In this case, uh, if you, for instance, you have <coughs> a molecule that, like uh, sodium or the sulfate or uh, many detergents, uh, if you start with low concentration, you have monomers. I mean, mo mo uh, you have uh, single molecules in the water. But if you increase the concentration, at some point, those would aggregate and form micelles because of their amphiphilic nature. So the water repelling part of the molecule stay packed together and form a micelle. And there's a typical size for the micelle that is given by the molecular size. And as soon as you have enough concentration to form micelles, the concentration of micelles will grow, while the concentration of monomers will stay constant. Monomers, perhaps, not uh, appropriate, uh, single molecules. Uh, and uh, uh, the equilibrium between molecules that you have in the 
surface that is kind of constant and this, this concentration that you have at the, at the limit, the equilibrium between these molecules that are in the surface and the molecules that are in the interface is uh, given in most cases by the Gibbs equation or variation, but let it keep simple on the Gibbs. And uh, this equation tells us that the surface concentration is related to the, to the thermal energy, to the, to the surface tension, and how the surface tension depends on the concentration. And this is a typical uh, example of dependence on the concentration. Look on the horizontal scale. I have the concentration of surfactant in logarithmic scale. Uh, when on vertical, I have the surface tension. So how many molecules are reducing, how the, the surface energy is reduced by the surfactant. And this value is reached, I mean, by measuring surface tension uh, as a function of time and there's some Probably there's also some kinetics. When you add more molecules in the subface, they will take some time to, to migrate to the surface. One way of measuring this is doing with the Lamy trough and other methods. Other methods are pendant drop or pendant droplets. And there are many ways of measuring this. Uh, so the model that I have in mind that keeps for the model which have a concentration in the liquid. I have zero concentration in the air, in the gas, and I have an excess in the interface. And this excess is related to uh, what I was saying, to the reduction in the energy cost. You can have also nanoparticles that are stabilizing going to the interface. So not only solid molecules, but also nanoparticles. Nanoparticles are kind of similar, so could be uh, completely hydrophobic, then they stay on the surface in any case, but could be also partly hydrophilic, so you have a balance between nanoparticles that are in the liquid and particles that go on the interface. And uh, you can also play with surfactants so that you can vary the hydrophilic or hydrophobic nature of the, of the, of the nanoparticles. Nanoparticles, <coughs> nanoparticle stabilized interfaces are important for stabilizing foams and emulsions because uh, once a nanoparticle has reach the surface, it won't go away. While a uh, single molecule absorbed can desorb, the thermal energy is enough to desorb them. This is not the case for nanoparticles. Nanoparticles have such a large energy gain in going in the interface that they stay there forever. And this makes much more stable interfaces. So this is a way of stabilizing foams and emulsions. A pickering emulsion so called Pickering emulsion, is an emulsion stabilized by 100 nanometers or so particles. That, and they form a kind of armor around each droplet, which make it very strong and stable. OK, so it, yes, we said. Uh, and now we are working on this subject. And the, uh, the fact that you can use different particles uh, would allow, could allow you to have stimuli responsive systems, if you have magnetic particle or light sensitive surfactants, then you can make uh, foams or emulsion that whose stability is controlled externally by, the for, by stimulus. And this could be important, say, for instance, if you have in the oil industry, you want to extract oil from, from the water and separate and then recycle the same surfactant. And not, or in, when you have many situations in which you would like to have a surfactant whose surface activity is controllable so that you can use and reuse it and recycle it rather than uh, wasting it uh, every time. So a few words about emulsion. An emulsion, emulsion as we are already mentioned, is a suspension between two liquids that are not miscible. And uh, what drives, what reduces or drives the stability of an emulsion, there are basically three phenomena that can happen. The first is drainage. Drainage due to the difference in density. So if oil is lighter than water, it will go on the surface, on, on the top, in the upper part of your emulsion, separating from the water that is going down. Uh, drainage is also important in foams. In a foam, you have simply that the water content of the foam would decrease simply because the water is going down and the foam is getting dry. And it is get drier and drier, it will Less, be less stable. So drainage, one. Coarsening and Oswald ripening. Oswald ripening, we, we mentioned it before, is the migration of gas 
from small bubbles to large bubbles because of difference in Laplace pressure. This can be controlled by controlling the diffusivity of the gas or of the liquid if you have an emulsion between the two. But even if you have immiscible liquids, then you could have other methods of migration. My cells could transfer mass from one droplet to the other. So Oswald ripening is happening. It's ubiquitous also for in immiscible liquids. And finally, coalescence. That is the case where you have two droplets that get into one because of breakage of the plateau border between the two. So these are the mechanisms that basically drive emulsion stability. <coughs> uh, now, there are many techniques to study emulsion. You can look at them on the macroscopic scale. You can do many things. Uh, what uh, we brought here for the hands-on session is uh, diffusing waste spectroscopy, that is DWS, a technique to, that uh, we want to, to use to study complex systems. And uh, yeah, and the technique is based on having a laser light, a coherent light source, monochromatic and coherent, uh, that is shining light on your sample. If the sample is static, you have a collection of speckles, and they are static. If something is moving in your sample, the speckle would move. And this is the case in this animation that I have taken from a uh, vendor site, LS instrument. And if you, cal if you measure the intensity as a function of time, you have this. Uh, then you can calculate correlation function for the intensity. And then from this correlation function, I will show you, you can get information about size of the particle that you have or and or the dynamics and the mechanical modulus of your system. <coughs> so all is all reduces in having, it's a very simple experiment, it's really tabletop and low cost. It's cost less than 2,000 euros. You have a, just a laser and a detector that can be fast or not fast, depending on your system. And then uh, calculate correlation functions. It's not really difficult to do it. Is it at one point? Good question. Same Thank point. you. Thank you. Good question. You can do it with a single point detector. You can do it with an array of detectors. If you do it with a single point detector, probably you, you are faster. If you, if you want to go very fast, you could put two photomultipliers in coincidence. You go to microseconds, you have a single point. Uh, this is good, uh, but sometimes, uh, for instance, if your system is out of equilibrium and ergotic hypothesis fails, then measuring for a long time a single point doesn't equivalent. It's not equivalent to the ensemble average because your system is stuck in some local minima. It's not exploring all the other configurations. In this case, you really need multispectral analysis. And that is done with an array of detectors, can be done with an array. You, you can do it in different ways. But one way, the way that we are doing is using an array of detectors that is simply a camera, a CMOS camera. You can use, use a webcam. If you do not need to go very fast, a webcam would go 30 frames per second. That is the speed of a webcam. And we can do it. Or you can use faster cameras depending on your, your needs and on your budget. And in this case, you calculate. And this the passage that we are kind of suggesting. From the time average of the correlation, fun uh, time, uh, correlation function calculated as a time average to a pixel average, and then maybe you make a time average. What is the difference between the two, as you were saying? First of all, non ergodic systems, then slow dynamics. If I have a system that is relaxing in one day, uh, in this approach, I need some days in order to get the correlation function with the proper statistics. Uh, which is maybe not ideal, uh, whereas in this case, with that single couple of images, probably I can get enough statistics. Uh, I can also calculate two times correlation function, which is something more subtle than this. This is, I mean, you probably know from other techniques. Uh, two times correlation function is the product of intensity in this square. I have time one, time two. And each point is the product of the intensity that I measure at time time, time one times the intensity I measure at time two. So the diagonal is the squares of the intensities. Uh, what does this graph tell me? Uh, first of all, if I have some aging, some evolution, the evolution goes along this way. If the dynamics is stationary, this thing would remain parallel. If something is happening, some here is slower, here is 
here is faster, so here is faster, the decay is faster, here the decay is lower, I can see it here. So two times correlation function, that this can be only calculated if I have pixel average. And then I can calculate also higher order correlation function, but I mean, I don't want to go too detailed. <clears throat> so how we, I understand what is going on, the hypothesis is that I have a diffusion path of light. Don't confuse diffusion of light with the Brownian diffusion of the particles. Particles can have their own Brownian diffusion in some case, or if I have a phone, it's another story. So it, it's not the diffusion of the particles that I'm talking about, it's the path of the light that it is a diffusive path. And this diffusive path is characterized by a length that is the typical length that the photon would travel before it's scattered again and is losing memory of where it was going. And uh, you can do accurate mean calculations to tell this uh, transport uh, photon mean of the path, how it goes with the, with the distance between the particles, because it, it can coincide with the distance between the particles, if the particles are a very strong scatterer, or you may need a number of single scattering event in order for the photon to lose memory of its uh, direction. Anyhow, uh, given this idea of uh, a star of a photon mean free path, the correlation function that we measure, the correlation function of the intensities that we measure, G2, is related to the correlation function of the electric field that is the thing that I can more easily calculate by the usual Seeger relation in which you have, this is the correlation that you measure, this is what you calculate, and there's some contrast that is determined by the, your experimental geometry. And G1 is given by this, the sum of all the contributions, so the integral over all the path lengths that the light could follow, weighted by, or measured in units of the transport mean free path, so this is the number of path of scattering event that the light has undergone during this path S, weighted by the probability that this path S is really covered by the light, and contributing a dephasing term which is typical of this path. So this is the main ingredient of my, of my signal. Uh, it's not very easy for me, it was not very easy to understand at the beginning. I found it easier to understand it in a time-resolved mode, which is a very nice experiment, which requires a lot of power from a pulse laser. But I mean, it's not what we are going to do, but I'm just showing you this because I think it's easier to understand. Oops. Uh, so <clears throat> this is the expression that we're writing. And if I can divide each path and measure each path on its own, then I have an individual contribution to the correlation function that is arising from this single path. And this is done, as I was saying, with the, if I have a, a very narrow pulse of light that is impinging on my sample, the light coming out of the sample will be spread out in time, depending on the length of the path that the light has covered. And <clears throat> if I calculate correlation function for a given delay, for a given time lag, then I'm selecting the correlation function for a particular path length S. And the result is that the result is that uh, the correlation function for each path length is an exponential, simple exponential, and this simple exponential has a characteristic time that is scaling with the length, with the delays, with the length. And I can also measure the, the P of S, this is the probability of finding this path simply by the intensity of light. So I think that in this way, you can understand what is going on in a diffusing wave experiment. The only disadvantage of this, not only, but not uh, minor, is that you need a very intense pulse laser, which is expensive, and not all the samples would stand. You don't want to fry your sample because you want a lot of power. It's, it's a, if you have a foam, you put a lot of power to simply destroy it. So th that was just for understanding, it's not what we are doing. Uh, what we are doing, we have a continuous wave laser, helium neon, 633 nanometers. Uh, we can work out the calculations, discover that in transmission, <coughs> if I look across the sample, uh, the correlation function will have 
a shape that is uh, this square root of time of the sin hyperbolic sinus of this, which looks much like an exponential. Uh, we won't use the exponential because it's not very accurate. Uh, we use the proper form, but uh, uh, just remember, it's kind of an exponential. Uh, I can also work in backscattering, which is advisable in many cases because <coughs> uh, there are two advantages. Uh, one is that if I'm working in a real environment, I'm, I want to monitor the, the mechanical modulus of something that is coming out of, of, of in, a, in a real situation. Uh, maybe it's easier to have a single optical access than having two. So. One advantage is that I have a single optical abscess that I can use it, say, in an industrial environment, or uh, I mean, it's easier to have it. Uh, the other is that it is lower. We will see why. In any case, in backscattering, I have a, a different shape. The shape is that of a stretched exponential. <coughs> and the stretched exponential is due to the fact that in backscattering, I have contribution from many different thicknesses, from the, many different depths. And uh, uh, shorter depth means uh, fast decay, uh, slow decay. Uh, deeper depth means uh, slower decay. And the sum of them means uh, uh, this stretch exponential shape. I uh, can also use this to extract the mean square displacement if I have particles that are scattering light. It depends on, then the interpretation depends on what I have. If I have particles that are scattering light, I can extract the mean square displacement of these scatterers. And this, from this mean square displacement via the generalized stokes einstein relation, I can calculate the mechanical modulus or the viscosity. In the easy case, we will do it with the glycerol, so it will be just viscosity. But in the general case, for a jammed system like this, you have uh, microparticles that are jammed or close to be jammed because of this high concentration. And you have this viscoelastic behavior with a crossover from viscose to elastic or uh, have uh, the concentration of polymer. Again, you have, this is just in the literature to, to show you that by this technique, you can make a, mechanical, a measurement of mechanical properties of your sample without touching it, just optically, and accessing a much wider frequency range that you would access with the mechanical rheometer. And this can be also coupled to mechanical rheometer. Mechanical rheometer would put some strain in your system. This is just based on spontaneous fluctuations. So this is always in equilibrium. Mechanical rheometer is under shear. OK, um, just skip some details. Uh, just an, an example of application uh, of this technique to real life problem, uh, making of yogurt. Uh, yogurt is made out of milk by bacteria that eat uh, sugar and uh, produce uh, Acid and in the acid environment, the proteins get uh, um, uh, they, they, they go to their isolated point and they become uh, larger and they form a gel in structure. They, they uh, engulf each other and form a gel, a gel structure. We can follow the formation of this gel by PWS uh, as a function of, of the acidity. As the acidity is increasing, pH going down, the correction function is getting slower and slower because the system is jamming. And uh, OK, that, I don't think we can go in all these details. Uh, classical studies on foam coarsening, uh, which is based on basically on, on size in the particles, by comparing, if I compare uh, backscattering and transmitted uh, decay, they are related by the L star. And the L star is related to the droplet size, to the bubble size. So <clears throat> I can get a direct measurement of the average droplet size inside the sample, which I couldn't do without tomography, perhaps. <laughs> it's, looking, it's kind of looking inside the sample, uh, not with all the detail that tomography will do, because you have just the average, but maybe with a faster result, you can do it on a system that's not so stable that you can do it uh, in, in real time. You can also follow coarsening and, and time evolution, basically, of a foam. And uh, also on emulsion, I and mean, this we'll see in the laboratory, if you want, we can see it in the laboratory, formation on emulsion and uh, the evolution, uh, both in terms of uh, the distance between, I mean, the, the size of the droplets and the distance between them, that is the information contained in the photon mean free path, but also in, the in terms of mechanical properties, of mean square displacement. Here I'm showing uh, this as a function of logarithm of time and plotting the logarithm of the mean square displacement. If you have Brownian motion, you have this dashed line. And 
at early times, you observe something that is pseudo-diffusive. So it's kind of like this. But as you go to later times, you find sub-diffusive and then caging effects. And these effects are more evident in the margin that have been stored uh, for some time. So it, I mean, this is something we can uh, look into in, uh, in, the, in the experimental session. So for the DWS, I think it's uh, a powerful tool for an easy, quick and dirty characterization. But you need also other techniques to understand what you are seeing. So it's not that it containing everything there. You, probably you have to combine this with uh, optical microscopy and other uh, characterization. But if you know many things on your system, then from the diffusing wave spectroscopy correlation function, you can get the evolution of some important parameters. Now, the last uh, five minutes, I guess, I've been talking too long on the first part. I wanted to kind of advertise uh, large-scale facility techniques like uh, um, reflectivity and grazing incident diffraction, which are useful for characterization of structures, and uh, photocorrelation spectroscopy, which is a new technique that is coming out these years for characterizing the dynamics. I think I will skip the first part. I mean, synchrotron radiation is what you need to have enough intensity for these techniques to work well. In particular, for the photocorrelation spectroscopy, you need a coherent beam, which is not something that you can easily have in your laboratory. You need a very high intensity. And, <clears throat> and this is only available at the lasers, uh, the, the third generation synchrotrons, and maybe at X-ray free electron lasers, which may have the opposite problem of too much intensity for the experiment that we are used to. So there are other experiments that you have to think of for, the, for these new sources. Anyhow, uh, I think that I will skip this part on reflectivity. You find in most textbooks. It's just a way of characterizing the thickness of your, of your sample and the internal structure. You can combine X-rays with neutrons. Neutrons have the advantage that you can put isotropic, isotopic uh, substitution. You can uh, differentiate different parts. But on the other hand, they don't access the same large Q range as X-rays. But I mean, that is kind of well established. Uh, you can also apply fluorescence to get the distribution of, of your ions. And uh, all this is and diffraction. But this is, I think, it's quite well, un well known. Uh, I want to spend just a few words on this uh, kind of new technique that is X-ray photocorrelation spectroscopy, which is covering a time space region which was not previously accessible directly by other techniques. I mean directly. In an indirect way, yes, of course, many techniques. But it is on the local scale of the atoms, because it's with X-rays, and on the, low, on the slow time scale of dynamic light scattering. Basically, it is like dynamic light scattering, but done with x-rays. So you see dynamics on the scale of milliseconds to hours on the local scale of the atoms to nanostructures. Uh, for doing this, you need, you need a coherent x-ray beam, which was, was not available till a few years ago. So this is a really new technique, because it relies on something that was not available before. Uh, nowadays, third I mean, synchrotrons like uh, the ESRF synchrotron in Grenoble <coughs> has a decent uh, flux, uh, it's enough flux for doing these experiments. Okay, no uh, what do you expect in a correlation function? If you have just something that is moving with a constant velocity, you get this, uh, this kind of shape. If you have a powder average, you have a kind of compressive exponential. If you have Brownian diffusion, it's like in dynamic light scattering. You have the usual thing as in the, in the Stokes-Einstein uh, model. Uh, in the rest of the system, you have this very nice uh, double step. This is not actually XPCS. It's DLS from Cipelletti and, and France. In, in France. Uh, so you can really address an explored region in space-time. And uh, for instance, this is just an example of work done by a friend uh, of mine, Beatrice Ruta, the SRF, uh, looking at the dynamics in, inside the glass. And you see some dynamics that you wouldn't expect below TG, below the glass transition temperature, where everything is arrested. And still, you have some local dynamics. Coming to the interfaces, <coughs> uh, you can apply the same trick in grazing incidence. So you see the dynamics in the, in the monolayer. 
uh, you can see out of equilibrium dynamics, this is again the two times correlation function I was showing for DWS, so time one, time two, and if the dynamics was stationary, this would be just constant, and this is broadening, meaning that the dynamics is slowing, slowing down. I can also measure dynamic heterogeneities and so on and so far. Uh, you can combine this technique with optical microscopy, with the uh, epifluorescence microscopy, and in this way you cover even a larger range of space or momentum on the same time scale. And in this way, for instance, we could uh, follow the arrest transition in uh, mixed monolayer of phospholipid and nanoparticles, which as you increase this, the, the, the density, you go from Brownian diffusion which is well understood in the Hughes regime to an arrested regime. And uh, okay, I mean, this is what, uh, just an example of things that you could do. And uh, just to finish, I want to leave you with some literature. Uh, a few references on DWS, and there's a chapter in this book, and the classical book on dynamic light scattering is also very informative. Uh, something on forms and, and scaling laws, and about X-ray techniques, uh, the best books for me is these elements of modern X-ray physics by Alice Nielsen, uh, many others, but also uh, this uh, chapter by Grubel and Madsen, who are kind of founders or uh, fathers of this technique. That is, uh, and this is all available. And thank you for your attention. We have time for a couple of quick questions.